Yeah. A, B, A, F, A, B, C. It's a behavioral, so it's more of a practical side too. And again, um, uh, the more I sit, I, 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 um, I spend time with you, I find out more people are um, um, experience it in one way or another, and more people think about it. So um, what we're doing here is uh, just starting the way. We, you know, the, the road is uh, like a thousand miles ahead of us, a thousand steps, and we're starting just the first step, which is getting to know our manpower. We need to have the manpower to do the service. Um, if it's not too late to start, it's always, there is always time. God has his own timing. And why we're starting today, we are not 20 years ago. We have actually started almost 20 years ago. And uh, the one standing before you, myself, I had uh, zero clue what does this mean. Zero. And I've been uh, uh, asked with families, do something. He says, what can I do? Do something. So they went and complained about me to Sayyidna. So Sayyidna, uh, do something. I said, okay. <laughs> Everybody says, do something. What is it that we can do? There is a lot. The Sahna, we started very now mild, very, now we don't, again, I said earlier, we don't want to be a prof professionals because professionals had their own training. What we're doing is that more of a building awareness. There was one comment, uh, and whoever the comment said it, she's not here, she's coming now. So there is one comment, there is one uh, suggestion, why don't we do this in front of uh, the whole congregation? Actually, you do. So there is a building awareness component to what we're doing. What we're trying to do today is two things. One, educate a, a fellow, those who are interested, you guys heard about it, you came, then you're interested, okay? We have been trying for the past, I believe, six months. Six months we've been advertising. We've been telling, uh, uh, asking the clergy to, uh, to ask. We send the three important links. One, for the clergy to tell us we need one ambassador, one person to deal with in the church. Just one. Alashan, we don't want to like, uh, make the clergy worry about what we're doing because, again, again, the clergy are like any other one, may not have an experience, may not know. They don't have the energy, they don't have the time. So we need one person to deal with. We were lucky to get one out of 45 churches. So they are, maybe they don't find, maybe they don't know that there are special members in their, in their congregation. We will find out. Then the second one is that, okay, give us someone to advertise to the congregation who is ever is interested. So we're lucky to get 32 today. 32, 33 today. Thank you, Jackie, you made the 33 one. So we have 33 people this, this today, and we have 25 last week. We're not sure who many, how many are going to continue, but we'd love you to continue. <laughs> Because uh, this service is different than preaching and teaching. It's demanding, physically demanding, mentally demanding. It's demanding, and you, you, will, you, all, you all know. Then we, uh, we need to talk to the pair, to the families, which is the difficult part. Because now, let's say uh, uh, Jackie is coming from San Marina, and uh, we have a couple of families in San Marina. Then we're going to assign Jackie to help with those families in San Marina. This is natural. But we need more because she's only one, and we have two. And we said maybe the ratio is one to two, uh, one, one ser two servants to one, uh, to one person, special. So we need four people like Jackie and one at church. So we will ask you to be our ambassadors. We'll ask you to, uh, whatever you have heard today here, that we, you can go and recruit more servants from your own churches to help in this service, right? So I hope that this, is, this becomes like, uh, you're becoming like this is the number one service. Although there are many other services, but this is the number one service. As I told you, it's guaranteed. Heaven is guaranteed. We need to have more of an army, because this is now, we do have awareness building, but again, it has to take guts from like the priest after the liturgy says, everybody do not leave. We need to talk to you about this specific service. 
And the, the, the spectrum of, of ministry is huge, but this is very important because as coming back from an Egyptian culture, we don't have uh, the right understanding of what is this about. And uh, also we don't have the right understanding of how do we deal with these situations. So I think uh, without labeling me as a fab or a, an Egyptian or any of the above, I, I think I need to be educated and I, I to then, of course, to the servants. This is important because the servants and the, uh, what's your name again? Olivia. Olivia. Olivia alerted me to, um, when they had a discussion with one of the servants here, we are not in a position to label anyone or to diagnose anyone. So it's not our job to diagnose this person as autistic or uh, uh, whatever disability, or, uh, it's not our job. Our job is to be educated, to get to the parents, to talk to them, educate yourself about what is the situation, how can I do, deal with this, what are the things that I need to be really worried about if I'm, I'm alone by myself in, the, with this, in this situation, and we will go through this, okay? So this last slide of, um, of the lecture, the, the past session, which is the do's and don'ts, is important because there are things that we should not do, and we have to be clear that we should not do. And we should only volunteer with caution of what to ask and how to ask it. The next uh, session, we're going to start by um, a clip. And uh, there will be the behavioral and how do we do with things. So please bear with us. And again, whatever we say here, with all the respect to those who are speaking, there is nothing called absolute. I may be right in that situation. You may see it differently. You haven't gone through the situation fully as I have done. So I'm giving you the, my experience. So maybe you have a different experience. So there is nothing absolute, OK? Uh, did you? What is it? Everything is recorded. Everything is recorded. The blonde guy. Um, one of the blessings that we have in San Marina is the service, the ministry for the special need. This is the blessings. Why? 
without them I haven't gone through يعني الكلام ده بيتسجل ابشوي ابشوي بيتسجل برضو بالنسبة لي نص الناس في الكنيسة اوتستيك بتضحكوا لأن with an autism you never know what's gonna happen right so uh, one day I had this early in my priesthood someone I come to the church early 7.30 in the morning I have three kids two in diapers and, and so I tell my wife you know what let's take them change in the in the church don't change them here why three kids and, and a priest I'm the only priest I need to start so every time I come to the church and one does every Sunday so I get agitated and anything happens among the deacons what do I do snap at them but then with the third time I started to tell what does he say I interpret now what does he say what does it mean it tells me relate right but what does he exactly want? In my mind what does he say I am sick I need you to pray for me before time comes first so I started to think differently so when I see here like there is a message but no there is a different message so without understanding so with autistic kids I will be playing and I get this we're playing I'm not hitting you I usually come out from the meeting in the day with either ripped gun or mitwasakh all over it's fine it's fine or I can say you know what I'm not coming to this liturgy but uh, you see what I'm saying so with these blessings in mind I started to see everybody different everybody is, has different mind because he can be physically sound but there might be a different he's thinking somewhere it's like the kid who was going to the mall don't take it uh, negatively huh I'm taking it positively now I started to treat people differently everyone is unique everyone it's not like everyone knows that the liturgy starts at 8 finishes at 11 30 everyone knows what to do every deacon knows what to do. no no there are people and I have I have uh, uh, among those deacons I have uh, deacons with uh, autism deacons with other uh, uh, different abilities there are one who doesn't speak he is nonverbal except one thing he knows the responses very well he knows to flip the pitch very well I have seen him when he was a little kid and disappeared for years and then I saw him standing at the altar beside me he knows much better than me much better than anybody why he's his different ability he memorized the whole liturgy he memorized that he doesn't speak except to the things that he has to respond so there are there are phases there are stages there are things that we don't know but this is a blessing okay and you have seen uh, the little boy, he says, I don't know what to do without her. It's a source of blessing. If we think it this way positively, then we will do miracles. I'll leave you with uh, Nancy. No, this is a, uh, no. I'll leave you with Nancy. Okay. Okay, so Abuna is absolutely right. It's, it's the frame of mind, the way you look at things, the way you reevaluate re things and people with their looking at people's abilities, not necessarily their disabilities. And um, that video was supposed to be, you know, like shown at the end of the other session. That's how I did about the family. And, and um, this is just another example of how sensitive you need to be to the siblings, not just the mom or dad. The phases of grief when you lose somebody you love that Salwa has been through, keep in mind, I just want to reiterate on that before we go on to the next session, keep in mind that it just doesn't happen once in their lifetime, you know, like they get the diagnosis or they get a baby born with a disability and so they go through the grief and then the, um, the denial and the resentment and the anger and then the bargaining and then the disappointment and then acceptance, that's it, they're done. No. They go through it over and over and over again. Every time a situation happens where you are reminded of that your, ch your child is not, and now the latest thing is we're not saying normal, because when you call them their normal friends, that means that you're saying your kids are not are abnormal. So now we're calling typical or neurotypical friends 
people without disabilities. <laughs> okay, so there are people with disabilities and people without disabilities now. So the thing is, is that you learn to be less judgmental of others and that opens up, you know, a whole new um, ways for you to take in people and accept them and serve them. And you're just automatically gonna teach other people. I mean, that, that child, the brother, I've seen brothers and families who resent and look down on their um, you know, special needs siblings or brother or sister. Because maybe the parents didn't instill in them from early on that they're still our responsibility. They're your brother and sister. We still need to love them the same. We take care of them. You need to be part of the family. You need to be part of taking care of them. So if you don't instill that in, in the child early on, it's very, um, it's very hard. The siblings, you know, it takes up a lot from their parents' attention because I need to go with my hospitalized kid. I'm not gonna go to the parent conference meeting with my, um, you know, neurotypical child when my other son is in the hospital. I'm not gonna pay for him $300 for camp when I need to get braces for my other child to walk. You know, so it, it, there's a lot of, they feel they're not equally treated, they're not equally given the attention and love of their parents. Sometimes, if you're not, you know, teaching them from early on that that's not the case, that you are part of this too, and just that, like the parents make sacrifices, the siblings, willingly or not, have to make sacrifices as well. So it's nice when we see a positive um, situation like that. So. Now we're gonna move on to the strategies, the questions that you guys have been having the last session about what do I do if, I, if you know, we're in Sunday school and this kid does that or he doesn't wanna sit down or he sits on the floor and he won't move. We're gonna um, go through um, looking at different behaviors that special needs children. And again, when I say children, it may be adults too. They act the same way because they have the same deficits. Um, so just think of this, behavior is the first language that anyone understands or learns. When a baby cries, you give him a bottle. When he starts crying again, you change his dirty diaper. And so that baby learns from the day he's born that when I cry, I get comforted, I get what I need. So guess what, when, he need, when he's hungry, he'll cry again. When he needs his diaper changed, he'll cry again. So it's the very first language that um, children learn. Now, behavior is, um, I mean, the word behavior, we all behave. We all have certain behaviors that we do every day. It's, it's, we need to look at it as it's called maladaptive behavior. Adaptive behavior is something that you do in order to adapt to your environment and be able to function in it successfully. So a maladaptive behavior is a behavior that's not accepted by your community or it's not okay to use in an environment. Let me give you an example. We had one who uh, would come to liturgy in like halfway or at a certain point, she'll cover her ears, start screaming, go towards the door and run into the parking lot. And parents would chase her, the other you know, servants would chase her and stuff. And she covers her ears and she screams. And then when we talked to the parents, they told us she doesn't like loud noises. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be specific loud noises. It was the, when uh, the, um, Deacon would bring out the instruments, you know, the symbols and the triangle or whatever. That to her was torture. Or when we talked in a microphone. So Abona started doing El Odes without a microphone. There aren't that many people. And, you know, if we all kind of sit and try to listen, it's fine. So he didn't use the microphone because that to her was um, very painful and she had to run. Now, running outside got her what she wanted. She avoided being in pain. She got away from the pain and she got into a more comfortable place outside where there's less of these noises in the environment that would irritate her. But running into the street and ending up getting hit by a car, is that a good adaptive behavior to deal with a problem? No. So eventually, parents and um, um, behavior therapists taught her that she can cover her ears, ask to be removed using a picture because she doesn't have any language, or put earmuffs on her um, on her ears during mass to to you know dump down the noise, so that's more adaptive. So now she's able to sit during the whole service because she has her ears covered with the earmuffs. 
And that's what we call an adaptive behavior or adaptive, sometimes they call it adaptive technology. It's the, those iPad that are um, uh, programmed to, uh, you can type with your eyes. You know, kids who are paralyzed from the neck down, they can type with their eyes. And that way they can communicate. Um, so these are called adaptive technology or adaptive equipment, like a wheelchair is an adaptive equipment. So at the same time for the kids who have sensory behaviors or sensory mal causing them to have maladaptive behavior, we need to replace that maladaptive behavior with an adaptive one in order for them to be a more successful. So the point from the crying gets you diapers, the clean diapers, the crying gets you a formula, reinforced behaviors will repeat. The aim of today's goal talking about the behaviors is that for you guys to learn some of the terminology too that you'll be hearing from parents. So sometimes the parents will come. Supremely thankfully saying, Our Father who art in heavens. I'm sorry for interruption, and you will continue. Um, okay, so I said one of the goals from today is for you uh, to be familiarized with some of the terminology or terms you're going to hear from parents um, or anybody else who works with a child with a disability. For example, the parent might, uh, you know, while they're dropping them off for them to attend Sunday school or some activity or having a church, they might say, um, um, oh, here's, the, here's this, it's the reinforcement that we're using for him. Um, or his ABA uh, program says that you have to, 
you know, do this or that with him. So you need to know these terminologies just to know what's an ABA, what's a reinforcer. Basically, a reinforcer is something. It's like, uh, think of it as a reward, something that they will get if they perform a certain behavior or if they do something for you, then they get a reinforcer, um, something that they would like to do. It can be a verbal reinforcer. It doesn't have to be something materialistic. It can be, oh, great job. I'm so proud of how you did that. High five. You know, that's called a reinforcer. It's a praise. It's um, um, a toy that they like to, to use or something that they like to do. Um, it could be, you know, you'll get two minutes on the phone. So just keep, keep in mind when the parent says, use the phone as a reinforcer or use his iPad. It's in his backpack, you know. Then you'll know what that means. Reinforcer means it's something that he will work for, something that he will... Um, utilize an adaptive, or you can use it to teach him an adaptive behavior. Um, keep in mind, behavior is also communication. I mean, you're trying to get to, to, to tell something when you don't have language. You know, how do you, you know, say while you're in church, well, this is too loud, it hurts my ears. You're not able to do that. So the way you deal with it, since I can't tell anybody that I'm in pain, I'm just going to run out. And so it's your job to try to um, understand what they're trying to communicate to you. My daughter, well, let me give you this quick example. My daughter, for example, was, um, they called her an eloper. She was a runner. So in the, her classroom, and, you, and this might apply to your Sunday school classes too, she would always walk up, you know, open the door and run. She doesn't understand what's going on. You know, when it was story time, she's not interested in stories because the language is too high for her. So she was getting bored. And when she ran out the door, guess what? Somebody always ran after her because they're worried. They want to keep her safe. So to her, that was a game. You know, I'm, I'm having my own game and I'm having fun instead of sitting and listening to a boring story. So um, we used her, um, her sensory overload against her, and I'm sorry if I was a mean mom, but the teacher was really having a hard time, and the principal would have to, you know, chase her around the school. So Natalie always had, just like that, um, very good sense of smell, extreme sense of hearing. I mean, she would cry and go under the bed if we used a vacuum or her dad's drill or anything like that. But um, uh, Fourth of July, for example, was never something that we ever celebrated or went to because those, pop, you know, the pops were too hot. So I told the a teacher, put a balloon. One of the things she really, Natalie, really fear, feared at birthday parties, balloons, because they would pop. And that popping noise was piercing for her. So I said, just hang a balloon somewhere near the door and see if she, and sure enough, when they did it, she never went near the door again, never went outside again. And the reason this example came to mind, I wanted to say it to you, is because when you're in you're helping a child in Sunday school. Think about what's in the room, how you can arrange the furniture maybe. If he's a runner, then make sure when you're in that room, have somebody, you know, an able body stay by the door or move a table, you know, or something that's close by the door, you know, to block him or give you time to react because they can be very fast. They'll open and out the door in their ball before you could even say, hey, come back, <laughs> you know? So you need to think ahead you know, almost like always think ahead, knowing what their, um, what we call triggers are, the things that will trigger these sudden behaviors from their parents and from observing them and working with them, of course. So we already talked about maladaptive behavior. Like we said, it's often used to reduce somebody's anxiety, just like when you bite on the, on the you know, pencil end at, in, at a lecture because that calms you down, helps you focus more. So these people here are uh, children with uh, autism or Down syndrome or other disabilities. They use these behaviors to calm themselves down, to be able to stay calm and stay within that classroom or within that environment. They will flap their arms. Alex used to flap his arms so hard and so bad. It was so noticeable. So I, I just kept starting, you know, to like put his arm down every time his arm goes up. So now he walks around in the mall going like this. You know, which is less noticeable. Nobody notices. One of his hands is always twirling like that. And that, to him, eventually replaced the hand flapping just to calm him down when he's in a nervous 
uh, environment or situation. So behavior modification is changing those, trying to teach the kids, changing those maladaptive behaviors to more adaptive or to ones that can be accepted in a community or society. So people who study behavior, psychologists who study behavior, they know that they can modify behavior, they can change somebody's behavior. And one of the strategies or methods that is used to change somebody's behavior is called ABA. ABA stands for Applied Behavior Analysis. So basically, it's, they take what they know about behavior. Behavior gets repeated when, depending on the reinforcer. Like I said, reinforcer is the reward, is what you get when you behave this way. Um, if my, my husband is nice to me, I'll have a mahshi tonight. But if he's not, guess what? He's getting full. <laughs> so he's going to learn that, oh, when I'm nice, she actually makes me, makes me mahshi yummy. So I better be nice because when I'm not, I'll get full. So the outcome determines the behavior that happens before. Okay, think of it that way. Um, so um, applied behavior analysis, analysis is analyzing the behavior, seeing why it happens. Is the person trying to communicate something? Is he trying to avoid a task? You know, like something he doesn't like, so he doesn't want to be into that room. I don't like the noise. I don't, so I'm doing it for avoidance. You're trying to understand what are they communicating with that behavior. That's what the analysis part comes from. The positive, also be, applied behavior analysis as a strategy also depends on the positive reinforcement. You're always trying to give them mashi, something they really like, in order to get them to behave the way you want them to. That's what positive reinforcement is. And like I said, think of it as a reward. It's not a bribe. I'm not bribing the children or that person because we all do this every day of our lives. If you didn't get paid at the end of the month, you wouldn't be going to your job every day no matter how much you love it. You're not gonna get up at seven o'clock and go through traffic and go to your work every day if you're not getting paid at the end of the month. That's your positive reinforcement. That what gets you out of the bed and gets you going day after day is you're getting something at the end of your work. What's in it for me? What am I doing this for? Keep that in mind. Those um, are the things those children are implying. Maybe not thinking, but that's how they uh, work. So, Inside the ABA, the Applied Behavior Analysis, how they analyze it is behavior is by looking at something that we call the ABC. So the A stands for antecedent. Antecedent is something that happens right be before the behavior. So what they do with this is actually, and that's what I do in my job a lot, I get you know a sheet of paper uh, that is you know um, organized a certain way. And I sit and I just watch this kid and I take so much information. You know, when is this behavior happening? How many times a day does it happen? What happens right before it happens? You know, so for example, um, a kid who, when you say, oh, it's time to clean up, they automatically go under the table and they start kicking the table or kicking the furniture and it's not safe for the kids around them. Why is he doing that? What triggered it? Oh, it's the word, let's clean up. So he doesn't like it when somebody says it's time to clean up. So what are we going to do at, you know, about that? So we'll go into that more in depth. But that's how you're looking at the antecedent. Antecedent is what happens right before the maladaptive behavior or your target behavior, the behavior you're looking to change, is happening. You need to know what happens right before it. So you can figure out what the trigger is. You know, You could have somebody sitting in a room and they're doing fine and then... Somebody walks past them and they start getting upset and hitting their head and you're like, well, what happened now, you know? Oh, it was somebody new who walked in the room. Guess what? They could have a very, you know, strong perfume on that just triggered that person's sense of smell that he can't take it anymore. So you need to look at them. Something is, you know, triggered this. They're behaving this way. I need to move them maybe away a little bit from everybody else and that's okay. So you're looking at what happens right before the behavior. You're looking at the behavior that you're looking to change. And the consequence, like I said, or the reinforcer is what happens right after. You have to be careful with the consequence because, like I said, people who invented this strategy believe that the consequence is what um, 
decides what the behavior is going to, you know, be changed or not, or the behavior going to modify, happen again or not. So, for example, let me give you a quick example. You, the mom walks into the, and this has happened with all of us. You take your kid to the grocery store, and then as soon as you pass the candy aisle or he sees some candy, he's like, well, I want candy. And you're like, no, we're not going to have candy right now. We're not buying candy today. Well, then the kids doesn't like that, and he starts screaming and crying, and you're like, you're being a strong, you know, minded mom, and I'm going to put my foot down. No, I said no candy. Well, the screaming gets louder and louder, and then by the time you get to the register, everybody's looking, you're embarrassed, so you're like, okay, just this one time, you know, just stop crying, and you give him the candy. Guess what he learned? The consequence of the crying and the screaming, not just any crying and screaming, louder and louder crying and screaming, is what got me the candy. So next time he goes into the store, guess what? Why bother asking, Mom, I want candy? He's just going to cry, I want candy, you know, as loud as he can, because that's what got him the candy last time. And be careful, because kids, not just neurotypical kids, but kids with disabilities are very smart. And if it works for them once or twice, then that's going to be their habit for a long time until you're able to change it again. So after looking at the consequence, now we want to teach the kid we're going to, we, the only thing we can manipulate is the consequence, really, because that's your reaction to their behavior. That's the only thing we can, you know, really con control. The antecedent can be anything in the environment. It can be the um, um, fire truck passing by, the siren just triggered him, and now he's going, you know, off the, the wall, and he's screaming and pushing chairs and hitting each other. Other people want to get out. So the antecedent, even though it may not be in your control, but the consequence definitely is. That's where the applied behavior analysis mostly focuses on in order to teach what we call a replacement behavior. Replacement behavior is what you want to replace the behavior with, the, the maladaptive behavior with. For example, when a mom, what do you do when you take your kid to a store? On your way in, you're like, okay, this time. Another term is called front loading. Front loading means you're telling them ahead of time what you expect, what your expectations are, or what's going to happen when we go into Sunday school. We're going to read a story first, then they're going to learn a song. So you need to know ahead of time what the schedule is, because you might know that your child can sit through a story, but they can't start, you know, stay in the singing. It's too loud. There's different tones of voices. So maybe when they're learning the new hymn or song, that's the time he goes out and uses his reinforcement. Because he already sat the 10 minutes for the story, and that's great. That's improvement. But you know he's not going to be, you know, behaving well when they start learning the song. So things like that that you got to be aware of. But a replacement behavior, for example, and this is something for you. You can use with your own, you know, typical kids too. Remember to say less no. People with disability don't, write to, don't like to be re corrected all the time. The less no, the less negative. We need to think more positively. How to put this in a positive way. For example, before I take Natalie into the store, I don't say, okay, we're no running and no, no being loud, and no touching anything on the shelves, and no this, and no, you know, don't give them a list of no's. Give them a list of what they can do. You know, replace it with the positive. Replace it with what you want them to do or expect them to do or the right thing to do. So, for example, when we go in the store today, we're going to use our walking feet. We're not going to run in the store. So you remind them, what else can I do besides running? Oh, I can walk. When we go into the store, we're not touching the candy. You can use your words to tell me which one you want. And we can buy it later for dinner. If you're using your indoor voice and we're not screaming in the store. Do you see how the, the way you're, you're phrasing to them, what is the right thing to do, what's the positive thing to do, what's your expectation of them is? Instead of focusing on the negative, which is the running and the screaming and the touching, and the, you're replacing already their behavior with what you want them or expect them to do. So in short, the ABA programs that you're going to hear a lot from the parents of because that's the end thing right now. Everybody's getting ABA at home. 
um, or at school or sometimes that, you know, like if you are able to get a good agency that would follow them to church and put a, an ABA program for their church, or for their camp, they do that. So um, it's basically psychologists or people who are trained that look at these, at these uh, behaviors that they want to be replaced and they put a behavior plan. You know, whether it's you're working on communication skills, social skills, self-care or um, play, they are looking into uh, a program to, re to find their replacement behaviors. Um, so the number one, 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 one thing, and this is something that, again, through your communication with the parents, you're going to find out is what is the reinforcing thing for the child. Some kids will do anything for uh, my son, for example, anything for Barney. You know, you promise him he can have watch Barney for five minutes, he'll do anything prior to that. Natalie, um, unfortunately, is turned into a shopaholic. She will go to Target, buy new shoes, buy new pants. You know, her closet is always overflowing. But luckily, we donate to the homeless um, almost every week. <laughs> um, but that's the reinforcement. That's the thing that they'll work for, that they'll, you know, try to adjust their uh, behavior for. And one of the things that I wanted to really point out, and Selva pointed out this, you know, be positive with the parents. Positive, 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 even with the children you're working with because the research shows that they respond more to positive, um, just even wording, you know? Just remember, don't be negative because we have a tendency as a culture too. It's like, well, but the, the. my mom used to like talk to my niece who's five years old. It used to drive Natalie nuts because Natalie doesn't like conflict, doesn't like overcorrection. My mom was like this, my five-year-old, she eats her dinner and my mom immediately is like, Wait a minute, where are you going? Who's, uh, uh, you know, how many times did I say, put your plate in the sink? You know, that's the way, automatically, she's just teaching her good manners. But the way it's being taught is so negative. It's like you think Rita has caused a huge, you know, mess or something. And so every time my mom and my niece would come over, Natalie would lock herself in the room because she doesn't want to deal with this. The way the implication is that it's negative, negative. So one of the things I wanted to show you, one of the things we use um, at my job, Abuna, maybe I'll So one of the things we use at work, I just want to give you an example. I brought today um, some of the things that we utilize at, at work, and I utilize them at home too. I even brought you Alex's wallet. Remember that these friends, because they have a lot of sensory input that they need to process, their response time or their auditory understanding and processing may not be as fast as you. So when you ask somebody to do something you know, um, for example, I'll use Alex and Natalie's names just because. Um, Alex, you need to move and go sit next to Johnny. And he doesn't get up. You need to make sure he heard you first over the rest of the noise in the room because you know how our Sunday school kindergarten classes sometimes are very noisy and stuff. Alex may be focused on something totally, you know, different that he's not listening to you. He's tuning out as much noise as he can because it's so much input for him. So he they have that ability. They'll tune you out. Like she said, she got a hearing test for her, her son. Alex would not respond to his name if it was Alex, Alex, he's right there. We call his name nothing. And we thought he was deaf until we figured out that if we're, you know, Alex is upstairs, I'm changing him, and his dad puts on Barney downstairs, he comes down the stairs running. It's like, oh, he's not deaf. He can hear Barney, you know, like two stories up. <laughs> so they can tune out noises in people and stuff like that because that's how they cope. So um, this is what I'm talking about, replacement behavior. And maybe this is something that eventually we can use if we're depending on the churches, what kind of services we're going to have, Sunday schools and how many churches, stuff like that. But instead of telling him you're too loud, I have a picture that says quiet. Please be quiet. 
instead of telling him, you know, your hands are busy or no flapping, show me quiet hands. And it has a picture. And I model for him. And that's another term in AP, doing the modeling or the prompting. Prompting meaning you're helping him do what you want him to do. If he's not responding right away, there could be a physical prompt or a verbal prompt or a visual prompt. Visual means they're visual learner, learners. They learn more or when they pair it with the auditory command they're giving and they can see something at the same time, it's easier for them to understand and learn. So instead of you know saying no flapping your arms, I'm saying quiet hands and so on. You know, instead of saying you need to be quiet and listen, oh look, I need you to be a good listener. We need to look at the teacher and so on. Um, we need to be sitting in the chair. So if you have a kid who's always on the floor or not moving along, there's a stand up and walk, you know. And then there's a few of them where do you need a break? You know, there's a break card for them to communicate that they want a break or they want to go to the bathroom. And then there's some positive <laughs> praises. Sorry, and then there's some positive praises like way to go, good job, hooray, you know, with somebody raising their arms like that. But what I wanted you to notice from this is, look how many, we, we um, made sure that all the pictures are backed on green cards, and there's this one, this one red one, and we made it for ourselves at work. We thought about this idea and came up with it together to remind us how many times we need to be positive versus negative. So keep in mind the ratio needs to be 10 to 1. So for every one negative comment that you catch yourself making or saying to a parent or to the child you're working with, remind yourself, oh, now I have to do 10 positive ones to make up for that one negative. So once I was saying, if a family says, how did my kid do today? Instead of like what the response you got, you mean what didn't he do, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like, oh, you know what? Um, first, you know, he came with me to class and he sat for the first five minutes. You can do it and, you know, sandwich the negative and um, say, but he got a little agitated, but we were able to get him back I use the toy that you gave me. Always ask parents if they have a reinforcer for the child. There's something they like to hold while they're in the room. Um, let's keep going, because some of that is going to come up later in the other things we're going to talk about. So three minutes? OK, I'm going to talk fast. Um, I can't. <laughs> I can talk really fast. So general strategies, just for overstimulated children, for example, teach him how to ask for a break. And that's OK. That's really typical. That's better than crying and screaming and rolling on the floor. Teach him ahead of time. We're going to go into a class right now. We're going to learn a story. But if you need a break, you know, if they're able to, you're able to make a sign with them or even get, um, you know what I use with my daughter a lot? Because you can't always produce these nice pictures everywhere, you know, on the spot. Uh, Post-it um, notepad. If you keep that on you, just draw something. It can be the word no. It can be the word stop. It can be the word break. Because they are very visual learners. My son doesn't know how to read, but he has memorized the way the word break is. So he knows that that kind of like drawing or whatever, silly drawing, he doesn't know what writing is. But he knows that that way the thing is drawn means break, you know? So you'll be surprised. You can draw something, a happy face, or a sad face, or um, draw a toilet, or you know, whatever. Post-it map will give you a way to show them a visual or help them ask for a break or not. Um, remember that when you're doing, I'm gonna put it, put you in the back, you know, in that seat or over here. It's not really um, timeout is not a good thing anymore. <laughs> we don't say timeout. But we can say, do you need a break? Do you need to you know, get away for a minute and come back? But don't imply that it's a punishment for them to ask for a break or to move at the end of the room for a minute. Um, like I said, try to change of the way you're you know, um, verbalizing things instead of the negative tone or it's time to clean up. Everybody needs to clean up now. Oh, I need you to help me clean up. 
And if they're not responding right away, you can say it again, repeat the demand you're asking, and you can give them a choice. And what, by choice, I call them the non-choice choice. A choice of something that either way, either choices is something that you will be okay with, that you would want them to do. Um, so for example, I need you to help me, and if they're not responding, do you want me to come help you do it, or you wanna do it by yourself? Do you need a minute? Because sometimes, really, Natalie's first response from her mouth was always no. And then you ignore her for a few seconds, she gets up and she does exactly what you asked her to do. But the first initial response was there, from her was always no. So when you provide a non-choice means, you're still gonna get them to clean up. You're not gonna back off from that. But now you're giving them a choice so they don't feel that you have the, all the control and they have none. Because giving control to people or in kids is always good. So but give them control, but in a way, you're getting them to do what you still want them to do. So give them a choice. You wanna do it in two minutes? Or you want me to help you in two minutes? Or you're gonna do it by yourself? So we'll go through uh, a couple of these real quick, hyperactivity. So when you know that somebody, the parents tell you, don't please use any terms like, oh, he's autistic or not, unless you're absolutely sure that he did get the diagnosis and the parents are okay with you using that term. They're just friends, special needs friends, doesn't matter if he's autistic or Down syndrome, unless the disability is very specific to a specific, you know, need that he have and you need to be aware of, don't label people. Um, people who are hyper and, you know, there's ADHD and there are other disabilities too that you're gonna have in your room. You don't need the label. But if they're hyper, make sure you do a running activity or something. Even in the classroom, you'll be surprised. You know, I do the hokey pokey, make them hold hands, make a circle, do a little song and, and jumping and dancing around. That calms them down a little bit. And you can do it as a group for the whole classroom, not just the one kid. Um, institute, teach them a freeze game so that if they need to run a lot or whatever, if you say freeze, you know, as a school teacher, I use that a lot, everybody freezes. And I get to talk over their voices from because they, they become quiet too. Uh, teach relaxation techniques. I'm gonna leave these visuals here on the table for you um, to look at. Oh to look at later, um, but you can teach them breathing, counting, um, to calm down. Uh, practice walking instead of running, like I said, let's use our running feet. Um, arrange the furniture, like I said earlier, to, put, you know, to use them as barriers to break up running patterns. Um, teach the child words, you know, in your classroom and even for your whole room or, or your own kids at home, words like calm versus active. And then use it in a positive way. So when your child who's usually flapping his arms during the lesson, whatever, you catch him for a second, he gets tired and he rests his arm for a second. You go, oh, I love your quiet or calm arms. I love your quiet hands. This is so good. Do you want another sticker? You know, find out what you can reward them with and that you can use, you know, throughout the time that you're spending with them or throughout the day. Who are you gonna find out from? The parents. Um, kids who are impulsive, again, you can give them, um, maybe they're talking in the classroom all the time, out of turn. You can give them a microphone or something, you know, like a talking stick, so they, you can specify, it's not your turn to talk, whoever has the stick, and you can hold the stick the whole time as a teacher. <laughs> I still have the stick, I still can talk. You know, it'll be your turn in a minute when you have the stick, something like that. Uh, provide limited choices with kids who turn, tend to be impulsive because that increases their stimulation. They get overstimulated when they have too many choices. Um, of course, the best remedy is to always engage them in meaningful activities. The more, the, the less the kids are challenged, and that's true for everybody across the board, for us too in our teenager at school, the less you're challenged or you're not doing anything, the more you're gonna misbehave and think of you know stuff to do that's not appropriate. It's the same thing with behaviors. Self-abuse and self-stimulation um, or self-abusive behavior is serious. You need to have um, two people. They're gonna start hurting themselves or others. You need to have, that's the situation where you really need to assign two bodies, not just one, because 
As for liability too, as a church or an institution, we, you need to have a witness. Because people who tend, like my son used to hit his head against the wall. If I come pick him up and he has a big bruise or he has blood or, you know, a cut or something, you know, I might say, well, you weren't supervising him or your ne neglect caused this. But if you can show that you really tried to help, but no matter what you did, he was able to, you know, or if you need to, I don't want to say restraining, because if you're not qualified, you can't restrain somebody. What I'm trying to get to in extreme cases or when you have people who might end up doing something like this, you need a witness, you need a buddy, you need to have two people assigned to work with that one person. So you're not left alone with them at any time and not being able to explain where did he get this bruise or how did he hit his head. You understand what I'm trying to say? Um, always work as a team, utilize a team approach. You know, like when, when if you want to start something in your service, God put it in your heart and you feel like, you know, I know at our church, we have at least a couple of kids who need something like this, and I'm willing to work with them. Find out, you know, from your priest who you can work with and form a team and have always have a team to back you up. Don't think by yourself and make all the decisions by yourself. You need a coordinator. You need someone at your church to be working on this program together. So always ask your priest first. If you're working with under somebody already in a coordinator and you're doing Sunday school or something like that, Always keep the ABC in the back of your head, you know, because behaviors change. They're not going to have the same behavior all the time. So believe me, I work on one behavior and we resolve it and we teach him a more appropriate, you know, replacement behavior. And then the following week, he comes up with another one. Now Alex does this. Now what are we going to do, you know? So you need to keep that in your head all the time. What are the triggers? What are the things that are ticking him off, starting him to run or scream or hit his head and things like that? Be aware of your environment always. Be consistent. So if one person is going to work with this child this week and then next Sunday it's going to be another person, the following Sunday is going to be another person, that kid is not going to you know, learn a routine or his behavior might change from one person to another. And like I said earlier, don't take it personal. They don't like you and they prefer to work with somebody else. It's not you. It's just something about you that's not right. <laughs> don't take it personal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and like I said, in very difficult situation, consider having a special buddy so they're, you're two, the ratio is two to one instead of one to one. Um, uh, again, like I said, special needs individuals make up for their lack of abilities with great intuition so they can sense when somebody's being genuine or positive or like I said, for some other reason, there's something about your tone of voice. Yeah perfume you wear, they're not able to, um, you know, deal with that, it overstimulates them. And again, it's best to have meetings to um, keep reevaluating what's working and what's not working um, in your program. And Mark is done. Before we, um, thank you, before we ask questions, can, uh, can I have uh, eight volunteers? Eight volunteers. Okay, I'm gonna choose. Come, volunteers, come here. Come here. Very good. Since we're talking about behavior, uh, as Nancy said, we're gonna leave this uh, here for you to see it. Do, please don't take it. These are four volunteers, eight, eight volunteers. Math, okay, come here. Two more. Two more. Very good, Yamari. Very good, Yajik. Very good. So uh, these are um, these are two families that we're gonna um, have. Um, these two families. One of those families are gonna have. Uh, yeah, Salwa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salwa. Sorry. Very observant. So, Nancy, I'm going to come explain the, the exercise. Gonna, this is what you're going to do. So, please pay attention. 
Okay, so we're just gonna um, pretend that we have a family that has a special needs person who is <laughs> blind. Let, hey, let him breathe. <laughs> He's blind, but he can breathe. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, give each family a set of pap some papers, and we're gonna give you exactly two minutes to strategize on um once again i'm trying i'm trying to get something to uh, like alimbi uh, think of a way to design these papers design these papers use any design and then you'll take turns throwing these papers from your side to their side the more you can get on each on either side yeah. Is the winner. They're gonna strategize for two minutes. And then, here, we're gonna put this here, and we're gonna put this here. So you get to have to get it past that blue paper. Now, it's a game, right? We, we selected two families to play a game, and the game is to throw all these paper that you have in hand to the other side. Okay? As many as you can. So we're going to give them two minutes to think of how they're going to do this. Remember, we have a, 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 a another special with a different ability, right? So think of two minutes how you're going to do this. This is an exercise. A game. We're going. We're going out to. We're going out to the park. We're asking you to uh, follow the task without asking any other questions, just to make sure that you're going to throw all these paper to the other side and see how many. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I want this side to observe this side, observe this side, and this side observe here. Time to clean, clean up, clean up. Time to clean, clean. Are you going to clean this way? Let me unloose you. <laughs> this needs to go checked by the CDC. So what happens? Who can tell me what happens? What did you observe? This group, can you please sit down? Thank you very much. So uh, this side here, what did you see this, this uh, group doing? What happened? This, this family here, that they don't have a, a special uh, uh, member, what did he do? They work independently, right? So each one, they distributed the, the papers and they started to throw it. What did this family do? They actually made the, the member, is the one who throws, why? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? Why did you do So did you? So he did not. So you were compensating for his, I would use disability at this point, right? So you were trying to like prepare for him, and he threw, right? So what? What this family did? Clear. They were aiming at them. Where was he aiming? He's much stronger. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, of course, one of the one of the members here in this family were, were telling him, "Can it be Merno? Like him? Yeah, higher, higher." <laughs> so they are giving him. So it could be like 
one person who has this ability with a disability and everybody else is really guiding him what to do. But there is a difference between enabling and uh, directing, right? So we need to learn. Of course, uh, we can ask uh, more questions. How did you feel about having a member here? It's an it's exercise, but how did you feel? Blaming? Yeah. Right, okay. This is like you're expanding the, the situation, yes. But within this situation, did you, it's a fun, of course, it's an exercise. They were slower at doing the task. But if you want to, uh, if you want to say who who won, was MP why why do you say that? Maybe they didn't understand the exercise. <laughs> so let's let let's see. Like okay, but you see the result kind of like tells us. Could be, could be, yes. You were in this side. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> because everybody here, like in the school, we as a family, everyone has his own car, everyone has his own stuff, so we go out, oh, everyone his own. But when is, does this remind you with a child with his sister, yeah. right? He was caring for her, so it created something. Of course, this is, this is not always the case, right? We try to get you and to get put yourself in the shoes of others. Put yourself in the shoes of those who have people with different disabilities that you're not used to. How did you feel about it, Ya Yusuf? Confused? You don't know what's going on, right? But there's something happened. You didn't know what's going on, but what did you do? They trust you trusted them. So they trust the family, right? But what the family, the rest of the family did? Something that I have noticed, but I'm trying to get you. He started to explain to you, right? Yeah. And to tell you, do this and do that, right? So you, they were telling him, so uh, you can do this. They trusted in him by giving him to throw away, maybe because he's, uh, his muscles and maybe, maybe they want to compensate for his uh, um, uh, different ability, right? Okay. So with this exercise in mind that always the, you can go, we can stop and say, let, if we would to do it again now, if we would ask the same team to go, there, would you do it differently? So the part of the, the training, the, the day, is to transform you from the knowledge that you have that is in the unconscious to bring it to be the, in the conscious. So we do expect you from now on to go out and to talk to parents and to talk to people in general in a different way. When you observe, when you see something, you start to say, step back a little and ask. Don't hurry. Step back a little and ask. Okay? So this is the first step that we need to learn. Let me remind you again, what was the goal for the exercise? Before you start to ask questions, um, there are three, four facts. I need you to make sure that the, they are they're clear. One. We're asking you, because it took us a while until we get this crowd, we're asking you to be our ambassadors in different churches where you're coming from, to start a seed, plant a seed, for this ministry for a special need, which is under the True Physician Ministry. Okay? If you are one coming from one church, your role is to go and explain and recruit other people who have this passion. If you're a parent, don't be just a parent, be a parent and a, and a, and a servant too. And to try to get uh, people to understand what is this about. Because again, it's a long relationship between the diaconia, the diocese, and, and the people, and how we are going to approach people and to start to serve them properly. Because they are services outside. We're not competing with the society or the regional center. We're, we're, we're adding, we're perfecting, we're we're completing something that people are always expecting the church would do, okay? If you don't have a service in your church, but you're here, then join another church, another team. Uh, educate the people around you about the services of the deaconine, specifically this one ministry, 
and they start to see, wait for, for other calls. So in May 9th, uh, as I said, there will be a gathering for the families. We don't know the families. So I'm asking you, with the Satan's permission, to talk to your fathers, the priest, and I tell them, I have attended this uh, day with uh, the Akunia under uh, the supervision of Abraham, and they taught us there could be uh, families with a special need member. I didn't say autistic, or the other word that I don't know how to pronounce, cerebral, thank you. I don't know how to say it. It's all liquid to me. So, uh, or any other. So Abuna, I want to help. Not Abuna, tell me what are the families to talk to them. Abuna says, thank you very much. I take care of this. But he says, Abuna, I want to serve. I want to help. So is there any family that we know of in the church that has a special need member that you can trust me I can help with? I already started the training with the diocese, with the diaconia. So Abuna says, hmm, tell me about it more. And once we have this, you're going to receive an email from us, from the diaconia, uh, asking, and of course it goes to the clergy too, asking what, who are the family. We need, to under, we need to know the guardians, whether it's a, a parent or, or any other one, name, number, and email. Okay. The next training for us is going to be on the 26th of, uh, 26th of April, yes, on Sunday evening from 5 to 8. Um, it's going to be in San Marina. And this is where we're going to train us all how we're going to do about what we're going to do about the May 9th. This is the first step because we need to listen to people. We need to comfort them. How are we going to contact them? What can we say? What information to be collected? Remember, it's a trust relationship. How can I trust you for my son or my daughter? It's a trust relationship. So we need to build it up. Okay? Uh, having said that, I'm going to just open the floor to say it and then to you ask questions or to ask questions to Nancy. Uh, don't get too many technical because, too much technical because technicality is going to come. But at this point, if you have any questions, Sayyidna is going to like uh, listen and conclude it for us. OK? In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, one God, I mean, I just uh, am happy to be with you this day. And I'm happy Nana. I just caught the part of the day because I had another servant meeting and a spiritual day in Valley in St. Mary, San Asanasius. So, um, I couldn't make it from uh, from the beginning, but at least I wanted to share with you يعني, a part of the day. Uh, as Abuna explained, I believe that he explained at the beginning, and also the servants, they prepared for uh, this training. Um, our mission in the Diakonia is to bring every man perfect in Jesus Christ. And when we put this mission, we did not um, explain it that we or excluded some uh, people in the society or in our congregation, but we need every man, every man to be a perfect in Jesus Christ. It, it, the idea came up when we started to serve the sick people, sick ministry, which we call it uh, true physician ministry. And then in the committee, we came up to the idea that we have to focus in one year in certain service or a certain people, they are uh, in need for a service from the church or focusing or to, more, to give more attention to this service in the, in our, among our community and the, among our people. So it came up first to help the autistic and uh, to focus this year 2020 on helping and then ended or uh, concluded that we do it as a general for all special needs. I believe that we have uh, some kids in our Sunday school in, uh, among our congregation, and it could be um, uh, didn't take uh, much attention from the church or from the Sunday school servants. Uh, that's why we built up uh, this net to have ambassadors in the church to help us to get more information about special needs in your church and in your congregation and to provide us 
with this uh, to, gi to give more attention for this service. F uh, I'm happy that this number came to today to the church and attend this training. And we, c we hope that you keep uh, this relationship going with us in the Akunea and with the training, uh, um, this, those they are responsible in charge of this training uh, day. Just would like to thank uh, Tabans and uh, all the churches they host us through these three weeks training. We started in uh, St. Marina Church and today at St. Maurice Church and next week Saturday we will be in St. Mary and St. Athanasius in San Fernando Valley. So I would like to thank the Father and the servants to uh, prepare for us and also to the committee, Abu Nabishoi, and to all the servants without mentioning any name. I know and I follow up all the messages night and uh, midday and uh, morning too many messages. Why? Because to make this day possible and to prepare it and to make it perfect. Uh, if, uh, I would like to thank each one of them uh, for, um, ma for making this day possible for us today and uh, uh, come at, uh, I would like also to thank you to give uh, you uh, to give us this time and uh, we would like uh, you to continue working in this as a parents or as a servants in your each one in his location on his uh, own church. Um, Nancy, if you have any question to Nancy now for the lecture or general uh, question for the Akunea, I mean, we are happy to answer. Yes. Well, again, it's it's going to depend. And like I said, the best thing, I, I feel that you really want to try to do this, the best thing is to first get a team. Because you're going to think together. And your, your resources, I mean, personally, when I do, even at my job, um, the internet is full of stuff. So you can, it depends on your kids' abilities. You need to get to know them. You need to, the parents to maybe fill out some information. We have what we call a reinforcer form. What will they, their kid really work for? What would they like to do? Do they have something they can bring to the classroom? And you're going to figure out, are they able to color? Maybe their Sunday school class is just, you know, watching a video about, um, or a story of Joseph and then coloring a picture of uh, Joseph, you know, and that's it. And, the, and this can apply for kids as old as my son. He's 25, but he really has no cognitive ability more than this, you know, is to color a picture and watch a video. You're not gonna, you know, sit him down and talk to him because he's 25, you know, about the moral of the story behind, you know, <laughs> uh, Noah, you know, being in the whales, you know, thing for three, but coloring a picture of Noah is fun. That's all he needs to know. If he can identify that's Noah and that's Jesus and there's a difference between the two pictures, that's great, that's a great goal. So it's really gonna depend on your church, the kids who are in there, what their abilities are, and what is the, your goal, you know, is to get them to grow a little bit in church, identify some saints' names, what their ability is, it's going to really depend. Yes? Um, yes, we can, yeah, we'll work on making like maybe a group where you guys can access some links and some information and stuff like that. And we'll, we have your emails now, so we'll let you know. Okay, I'm going to go with her because she has the microphone and then I'll have her give them. Don't forget your question. Go ahead. So with the, with the mild cases like um, high functioning, yes. when we can decide that they can be a push-in services, meaning like a, a, like a servant with them, or we can have like a specific class or take him to like a different class or take him out. Again, I think you can always try first, you know, like if they're mild. Um, I have my niece, for example, she has ADHD and we tried to put her in a, her own, you know, age kind of Sunday school class because she talks and stuff, but she cannot sit on the chair for more than 10 seconds to save her life. So she only lasted 10 minutes. 
And then she started screaming, let me out, let me out. She wanted to get out the door. You can't keep her in by force. So she got out. So it depends. And you need to learn. And that's the part of the uh, ABA. There's something called shaping the behavior. So this time she lasted 10 minutes. If I was working with her, I bet you, I don't bet you, but I'm telling you, you know, within a few weeks, I could get her to sit there for 30 minutes and listen and participate. How? You know, using the reinforcers. Again, she's got, you know, what's in it for her? If she sits here for 10 minutes or 30 minutes, she's not interested in what they're talking about. It doesn't make any sense to her. You know, like my son, you know, when you, when you talk like this normal, like to him, to him it's like nuclear physics. It's like you're talking Japanese. He doesn't make a word. So for her, I need to find what's reinforcing for her. And then I need a timer, something visual that shows her you're going to sit and do this number one, two, three, and then at the end you get out. So that it's called shaping the behavior. You know, if she sits for one minute on the chair, then we all, you know, throw a big deal. Yay, you did it. One minute. Give me a high five. You're done. You're done for the day. You sat for one minute. Well, next time, you're going to ask her for two minutes before you make that big a deal. And then next is going to be for three minutes. Well, what are you going to do if she only sits minutes? Oh, that was nice. One minute. Okay. Not a big deal. But now you're shaping the behavior by changing your response, you know? The, the bigger the response is, you're going to save the biggest reinforcers for the ultimate goal that you want. But if she does like a baby step of it, still give her a reinforcer, but not the big reinforcer, not the big one. And there was one video, I don't know if you guys have time, we'll play it if whoever wants to see it. It's exactly about that, you know, making steps and shaping the behavior. So in that one um, video, that kid at, at camp, he loves, he would die for Legos. But he also loves ice cream, and he loves going to the pool, and he loves other things. But his ultimate, ultimate prize would be Legos. So at camp, they told him, if you go and participate one game with your friends, you can go to the pool next. And then if you go ask a friend what they're doing, because he has a hard time initiating and playing and socializing with kids. So it was one of his goals. You need to go ask a friend what they're doing, if you can help them and join them. And if you do that, then you get the ice cream. So he gets the pool, he gets the ice cream for doing these baby steps. But ultimately, he participates in a game with a large group, and that's when he gets his Legos. Okay. <laughs> so, can be one last question, because I don't want to be unfair to her. Go ahead. Okay, uh, for uh, those kids who, um, when they stay for longer time, they start getting kind of aggressive, mm -hmm. okay, and start hitting other kids. Yes. And how to deal with that? Because it, it happens sometimes in some school classes, and we have the liturgy service that uh, servants stay with the kids during liturgy, and uh, of course the liturgy is kind of lo long for them, okay? So by longer time, they start being aggressive and start hitting other kids. Okay, so again, you need to shape that behavior by you know, deciding how, how much time you need to, like, try to analyze and see when do they start losing it. After 10 minutes, 15 minutes, well, you need to do something before they start losing it. Like, if they can only last 10, maybe they need to go, get a break. And you can disguise that break as, oh, let's go to the bathroom and come back. Take them to the bathroom and coming back, now you can start the 10 minutes over Sometimes because now he's taking... they don't want to return back. He can come back the last, you know, 15 <laughs> minutes. <in> my hand. <laughs> no, no, but you see, I'm saying now, if the delicacy is, uh, is restricted, but then you can have that special delicacy, but then why do we have to keep them in a, why, why do we have to keep them in a class for uh, 45 minutes to an hour like other kids? How Maybe to our do it? Class, hmm? How to do it if it, that's the liturgy time? Well, well, no, no, forget about the liturgy. The okay. liturgy with Sayyid I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, we can have a liturgy for an hour from one, one from A to B, A to okay. Z. But then why do we have to attend the liturgy for this specific family from A to Z? So we need to really, yani we don't have to have uh, one size fits all. And we may have to ad adapt ours, not adapt them, adapt ours too. Okay. 
So in a class, in a, in a Sunday school class, if you have this ability to bring a child to Sunday school class, maybe their time is only 20 minutes. So parents would, with those special kids come to this specific class, then it doesn't have to be 45 minutes or an hour with the regular Sunday school. So we need to also to think of how we adapt ourselves. Okay. Molly, anyone else? Yes, Matha. The meeting that we have on April, if we can just switch it instead of five a little bit early, because most of these families, especially if they're traveling, they will have school next day. So by eight o'clock or nine o'clock, it's going to be a hard day to stay there. So that's kind of, if we can think to move it a little bit early. Uh, I, I can't promise. Yeah. Uh, just a suggestion. Yeah, well, we thought of, but then we accumulated, and okay, we will. Uh, okay, and we will. The, we will. I will try my best. The other thing, uh, what's the plan in the next um, six months or next year to uh, create more awareness for the servants of the Sunday schools to accept at least right now, just to make more acceptance in our churches or our Sunday school for these kids who are uh, without complaining they're making noise or making troubles or uh, disturbing the class? Very good question. Uh, well, first of all, um, the recommendation that came out to uh, kind of like educate the servants, especially in the servants prep, to do this, so we are preparing from bottom up, that the servants, when the, uh, the new servant should have an idea about what is special need and how to deal with them. So it's not just one time like this, it's gonna be a sequence. Um, the, second, the, the other thing is that, as we said, we are planting a seed. So you're not gonna see the fruit right away into this year, but at least now we know that Midhat is from Palm Spring, he's gonna be starting a special need uh, class, Sunday school class, if it's, this is applicable, and I want you to, to underline the word applicable, because it's, an, again, we're not copy and paste. It's based on who is there. So if you have in, in one church, one cat, then we have one class, and we have one, one or two teachers. This is how the seed starts. Also, the idea came when I met uh, one of the mothers, she has uh, two kids, uh, special needs, and she told me that she did not have a time even to go to the mall or to enjoy her life. F it came up with some of the servants of this church that one day uh, per week that we can gather those special needs and uh, give the mother and the dad and the parents free time to go to the mall, to enjoy their time this evening. It is not necessary to be on the same day of the Sunday school, but it could be in another day in the church, which the church is empty, no, to, no many activities. So we can announce for that day for the parents that they have a special needs to bring them in the church. But we have to be trained to deal with this and also to, to, to let the parents sign up a waiver or something, they uh, all emergency numbers, because it could be happen something while they are not there. So we, we cannot take a responsibility of taking the kids and then we cannot handle the situation. That's why we came here for this training to know and also in April and in May and then we follow up. But also it is not only the Sunday school time but we have a regular service, khidma muntazima, a regular service in the church for the special needs. Eric. We understand that the regional center can help with this, even financially, to get someone to the house to take care of. But yet, let's say the mom wants, then we have cases, as said and I was mentioning, there is a mom, Rick, ask it, if you want to help me, send me someone, it's either to uh, organize the laundry or take care of my kid until I organize the laundry. To that extent, 
because the dad is working, the mom is taking care of the only daughter that she is like, uh, Nancy said she's a runner. Once she knows, and we hide the keys all over the place, okay? So um, there is a lot more bigger than just the Sunday school, but definitely the church, like we feel the church has to do something about it. You, don't say, can they do this? No, can I help in doing this? So please let us start with what we have here. And, and also to start, at least we can make centers in the, some Orange County in East or so. For, it's not only to gather the kids in the church, but also to prepare a place to host them. As you may listen in the, uh, I don't know which uh, lecture or uh, topic, uh, mentioned this in uh, the, the place where the special needs gather, it has to be attracted to them by colors, decoration, uh, to be prepared to uh, caution for if somebody fall, uh, fall in the ground or so also it is not only to find people human resources to serve these special needs but also to educate the church to prepare a place inside the church to make this special needs service if you go to any center and visit you find it's all equipped by a certain way to provide a good service for those. Also, we need this for the, from the churches. If we have some cases in one of the churches, we will ask the church, please prepare a place for those kids to be even during the Sunday school or another day. This is also, that's why we, we could in the future have a center uh, between some of the churches especially for this service or one of the churches to provide a place and we prepare it for this service and all the churches around surrounded this sir they can come for advice and to bring their kids also any other questions any other questions thank you again for your time and uh, and efforts and uh, prayers prayers that uh, this service would grow and uh, be fruitful in, in different churches. We thank you, Sayyidina, for being here.